Okay, well, our next speaker is someone who's very familiar to uh, many of us here at NYU. Um, Jan LeCun has um, been a pioneer in AI research for many years, you know, since back in the, uh, the 1980s, doing important research on machine learning, in particular neural networks, and has been a major force in the more recent rebranding of neural network research under the uh, label of, um, of deep learning, which has now begun pretty well to take over the, uh, the world. Um, Nick, um, Jan has been at NYU since uh, 2003 in computer science and headed up the, uh, was founding director of the Center for Data Science, which started about four years ago here. Since, um, since two or three years ago, we've been sharing him a little bit with, uh, with Facebook, where he's heading up the, uh, the AI group there, and uh, most recently has been a major player in starting the uh, partnership on AI, about which we might, I hope, hear a little bit today. Um, but Jan's topic today is, should we fear future AI systems? Please welcome Jan LeCun. Thank you, David. All right. Let's see if I can make this work. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'm sure I'm sure David wanted to wanted me to talk about perhaps uh, short-term impact or short-term questions surrounding ethics of AI, but I'm, I'm actually going to talk about the long-term stuff. So, um, should we fear future AI systems? So, there's sort of various pictures of uh, what you know how AI is supposed to behave in uh, in science fiction, uh, from you know C3PO, which basically does what you tell him, or you can turn it off if you're not happy, uh, to have 9,000 in 2001, A Space Odyssey. And there is you know, some collision sometimes of those two worlds uh, where people who expect robots to work like C-3PO are, get really annoyed when they work like HAL 9000. Um, HAL 9000 is the worst garage door opener ever, yes, indeed. So I have a terrible confession to make. I actually came to work on machine learning through philosophy. Um, uh, it was actually, uh, <laughs> or, or I should say, um, um, you know, theory of mind, linguistics, and things like this. So uh, there's this wonderful book that I stumbled on when I was an engineering student, uh, undergrad in 1979 or 1980, um, which was a debate between Noam Chomsky and Jean Piaget, and they brought their, both of their teams to, to debate the nature-nurture um, uh, questions. And I was, you know, reading... Um, things from the side of, uh, of Chomsky, not necessarily by, by, by him, um, but by you know, people kind of rooting for him. And I, I, thought, I, I thought it was um, kind of preposterous to think that intelligence could appear with, uh, with very little learning. Uh, on the other hand, uh, on the Jean Piaget side, um, there was uh, an article, uh, a transcript of a, of a talk by uh, a C Seymour Peppert, who's a mathematician at MIT who had worked on the perceptron. And this is the first time I encountered uh, um, the, the sort of the possibility of a learning machine. And so I started digging the literature from the 50s and kind of discovered the perceptron, which was an analog computer at the time. And believe it or not, the model of learning that we use today in 95%, I would say, of all the applications of machine learning and AI that you hear about are based on more or less the, this, this uh, very simple model of the perceptron, or, or things that are derived from it, essentially. Um, so it's, the basic idea of it is supervised learning, uh, where if you want to teach a machine to, say, classify images of cars from planes, you collect thousands of images of cars and planes, and you run them through the machine, and whenever, whenever the machine makes a mistake, you adjust its adjustable parameters, which are symbolized here by knobs, um, so that the, the answer you get gets closer to the answer you want. So it's kind of like showing a picture book to a, a small child where you, know, you show a picture of an elephant, you say it's an elephant, et cetera, and the child, of course, uh, after just a few examples of each uh, 
uh, object can, can figure out what the category is. With those uh, supervised learning machines, you need thousands of examples of each category the first time you train them. The second time you train them, they've pretty much figured out what an object is, and you only need a few examples of each, uh, of each sample. Uh, but it's supervised learning, so it requires human annotation, uh, human supervision, essentially, and it limits the power of, the, of those machines in the sense that they can only do things that, uh, for which we have a very clear input-output relationship that we can, we can produce. So this applies to not just image recognition, but language translation, classification of uh, topic in, in text, um, summarization, uh, all the tasks of, of AI systems that you see, ranking, search, um, uh, et cetera. So that's AI today. It's really not AI. It's uh, supervised learning. It's glorified uh, curve feeding, you could say. Um, so what has changed over the last few years is not that model, but it's the architecture, the internal architecture of the AI systems, which now use deep learning. So whereas the perceptron was composed of essentially a, a, a chunk that was sort of hand-designed, or, or classical pattern recognition system, were composed of a chunk that was hand-designed that we call a feature extractor, followed by a classifier, which actually embeds the, the, the learning abilities. Um, a deep learning system is basically a cascade or a collection of learning modules that are all trained simultaneously to, to, um, uh, to perform the task. And that allows that, that is qualitatively different in the sense that now the machine not, does not just learn to uh, classify things, but also learns to represent things. So it, it learns internal representations of the world. Uh, this is, of course, inspired by, by biology, very mildly inspired by, by neuroscience, um, not in the details of it, uh, just in the kind of underlying uh, general principles, but really not in the, in the details. So the kind of inspiration that we get here is similar to what, um, you know, early uh, um, pioneers of aviation got inspired by, by birds, but, of course, airplanes are very different from birds, even though they use the same principle to fly. Um, so that resulted uh, over the last few years, uh, I mean, the techniques that are used in AI systems, deep learning and things like that today are, um, are pretty old in their basic principle, um, about 30 years or so. Uh, but what has happened in the last few years is that the combination of the availability of large data sets and powerful machines has allowed us to solve new problems that really weren't solvable before. And so we, we can build those very large convolutional nets or recurrent nets or, or you know, uh, any one of a, a, a large uh, collection of different architectures of, of neural nets and get them to uh, recognize images, um, build, um, um, construct internal representations of images in a hierarchical manner. So there's this idea that, in fact, Piaget expresses a lot in the, the book I mentioned earlier that... Um, uh, learning proceeds in stages, and you, you sort of learn low-level concepts on top of which you, you build higher-level concepts, more abstract concepts. And this idea of deep learning is very much rooted in this idea that, uh, uh, you know, the, the way we uh, represent the world is, is, is hierarchical with uh, more and more abstract concepts built on top of kind of more elementary ones. In fact, the, the recent versions of those deep neural nets have uh, anywhere between 50 and 150 layers. Uh, it's become, there's, there's been a, a huge inflation in the number of layers in those, in those systems. And there's also been an inflation in the size of those systems in the sense that the number of adjustable parameters that we have in those, uh, in those models in, you know, is, is close to a billion or at least several hundred million. The amount of computation that takes place to recognize a single image, for example, is anywhere between one and 10 billion, sometimes even bigger. Um, so we're getting to the, the point where those, those networks are kind of the same size as what we encounter in biology, not the human brain, we're very far from this, but sort of, you know, small brains of small animals, if you want, small mammals. And, you know, with those techniques, we can, get, we, we can do things we couldn't do before in terms of, um, um, you know, detecting, recognizing objects. Um, uh, okay. Uh, you know, building systems that can um, uh, drive cars around and uh, which are based on these convolutional nets uh, techniques I was, I was mentioning earlier. And there's a, you know, a huge industry around this now where, you know, companies are trying to kind of get machines to drive themselves. That asks a, a whole host of short-term ethical questions which I'm not going to discuss. Um, so basically, uh, perception is not solved, but, but it sort of works now. Uh, we, can, we can build perception systems that work pretty well. In some instances, uh, have uh, as good or better performance as the human visual system for, for locating, identifying objects, um, 
Uh, so here's an example of recent results for a system uh, constructed at Facebook that can you know, detect and label and outline objects in images, including when they are uh, extremely blurry or ambiguous. Um, and, uh, you know, detect broccoli. <laughs> um, or even count sheeps. Um, <laughs> so that's perception. Okay, we know how to do perception now. And this was a very challenging task for classical AI because classical AI, uh, you know, tried to focus on sort of high higher level functions of human, um, uh, human reasoning, uh, logic, and things like this, uh, you know, without realizing that most people actually in the world have no idea how to do logic. But um, <laughs> as, um, <clears throat> you know, um, including people you might not want to vote for. And, um, <laughs> and um, so it turns out logic is relatively simple to, to mechanize. Uh, the problem with logic is to write down the, the rules that are necessary for, for logical deduction. And it turns out most of human knowledge cannot be reduced to a, a number of rules. So perception, for example, is very difficult to reduce to rules, which is why it took so many decades and it took techniques like deep learning to, uh, to be able to do perception. Basically, that takes the human engineer out of the loop. Uh, with deep learning, uh, the, the design of the system is very basic, and uh, uh, it's the data and the training that really builds the machine. And those learning algorithms are better at designing vision systems than human engineers are at, at doing it, which is sort of hum humbling for an engineer like me, but uh, that's the reality. Um, so what people are, are interested in, in now is uh, using the, the power of those deep learning methods to enable machines to do reasoning, uh, remember things. Turns out neural nets are kind of bad at remembering things. Um, so you have to do things like augment, augment them with a, a sort of... A, um, episodic memory, uh, similar to what the hippocampus does in the uh, mammalian brain. And so there's quite a bit of work on this, which um, is leading to um, kind of a sub-area of, of, of AI that I, th I think we could call uh, differentiable programming. So it's the idea that uh, you can build essentially a computer that has a memory and has, uh, or, or call it a knowledge base perhaps, and a kind of a, a, a comp computation engine, if you want, that operates on this memory and uh, that plays the, the role of uh, inference engine if you want in logic, but here, instead of manipulating symbols with logic, we manipulate vectors with algebra. So when we replace symbols and logic with vectors and algebra, what we get is computation that's smooth and differentiable, which means it's compatible with the learning algorithms that we use, which are essentially numerical. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting work on this, which I'm not gonna go into, but um, to focus really on the obstacles to AI. So, the state of the art is that you know, we know how to do supervised learning. Uh, we know how to do reinforcement learning, which I talk about in a minute. Um, but there's one piece of learning we don't know how to do that's called unsupervised learning. And the bad news is that that's what most of human learning is about. So um, AI, an AI system really is a combination of uh, perception, predictive modeling. So predictive modeling is the ability to essentially visualize or predict what's gonna happen in the world just because the world is being the world or because of, of our actions. So imagining what's gonna happen as, as, as we uh, take a sequence of actions is what allows us to plan ahead. And the ability to predict to some extent, I think is the ess essence of intelligence. Um, so we need predictive models. We need systems that can predict how the world evolves, the envir their environment, uh, remember what happened and uh, is able to reason and plan in this world. And we don't really know how to do this with machines. Uh, basically what we are asking here is the old um, question that uns unsolved problem in AI, how do we get machines to acquire common sense? So there is a, a famous set of problems in AI called uh, Winograd schemas. And you have an example of it here. Uh, my colleague in the computer science department, Ernie Davis, has a whole list of, all those, of those sentences, which are ambiguous. So if I say the trophy doesn't fit in the suitcase because it's too large, you know that the it refers to the trophy. If I said the trophy doesn't fit in the suitcase because it's too small, you know that the it refers to the suitcase now. And the only way you can lift this ambiguity for this reference, this, this pronoun reference, is, is because you know how the world works. You know what those objects are supposed to do and, and, and their, their, their geometry and all, all that stuff. Um, you know, how do we get machines to acquire this kind of stuff? We, we're not gonna type rules into, into machines for that. 
Uh, if I say um, uh, David picks up his bag and left the room, um, there is uh, you know, a lot of facts that you can infer that have to happen because you know how the world works. He probably has to stand up, extend his arm, pick up his bag, walk. It's not going to fly. It's not going to you know, fly through the wall. It's probably going to go through the door, etc. So you know the constraints of the physical world. That's what allows you to fill in the blanks of all the missing information that uh, can be derived from just those few words. That's common sense. And we, we just don't have any techniques right now that allow a machine to learn this kind of common sense. Um, so my hypothesis is that, um, and this is, in my opinion, the biggest obstacle to significant progress in AI, and one of the mountains that separates us from uh, the current state of the AI, which is very primitive and you know, uh, general intelligence, if you want, or super intelligence, or whatever you want to call it. Um, so there are three types of learning, reinforcement learning. So this is sort of like you know, training a, a circus animal or a pet. Uh, you wait for the animal to do the right uh, action, and then you give a reward. And that's very inefficient in the real world if it's done in isolation. Supervised learning I talked about already. This is what we know how to do now. But unsupervised learning, which is the ability of animals and humans and hopefully machines in the future to learn how the world works by observation, is something we don't know how to do. So the, the joke I've been making for a few months is if intelligence is a cake, the bulk of the cake is unsupervised learning, the icing on the cake is supervised learning, and the cherry on the cake is reinforcement learning. And the problem is we know how to make the icing on the cherry, but we have no idea how to make the cake. And so I, I, I sort of sympathize with my colleagues in the physics department who are sort of in the embarrassing situation to have to tell the world, um, you know, we, we know what about 5% of the mass of the universe is and the rest of the 95%, we have no idea what it is. Same thing here. So let's imagine what the architecture of the future AI system will be like. And this is where questions of the design of those machines and how we can control them will, will, will emerge. So um, uh, an intelligent machine will be composed of really two modules. I, I separated them, but they're really part of the same thing. Uh, an agent that uh, generates actions that influence the world, and then the world uh, gives it percepts or observations from which the, the agent can sort of infer the state of the world, if you want. Um, and the agent is trying to optimize an objective. That objective is sort of an, an immutable module inside of it that determines its morality, if you want. So it determines what, what the agent lives to do. To do. Um, and, and so the goal of the agent is to basically keep itself happy, which means uh, minimize the output of the objective over the long run. And so what it has to do is figure out what sequence of actions will produce uh, the, the proper percepts in the world that will put it in the state that will make its objective minimized, which is, you know, it will maximize it ha its happiness, if you want. So basically what will drive the machine to do something or not do something is the design of this objective, uh, as well as how good it is at uh, optimizing it, and then how cooperative the world is, obviously. So what does the agent um, have to, to do to be able to act intelligently? Internal to the agent, there has to be uh, a couple of modules that basically allow the agent to uh, imagine or plan uh, what a sequence of actions uh, is going to cause uh, in the world. Okay, so internally to the agent, this has to be some sort of world simulator that allows the, you know, a model of the world that allows the agent to figure out what's going to happen when I take this action or this sequence of actions, or what's going to happen if, you know, I just watch and the world does, does what it wants. So it's the kind of model of the world. I think it's an essential piece of intelligence, and that's why I'm saying, what I said before, the ability to predict is the essence of, of intelligence. Um, internally, there is an actor that generates action proposals that you know, we can run through the world simulator, which is kind of the way of imagining what's going to happen when we take an action. And what, there has to be also a critic. Uh, this is a, a term that's used in the context of reinforcement learning. It's basically a module that attempts to predict what the value of the objective is going to be for a particular sequence of events. And this is where the machine can uh, design substitute objectives for the real objective. So if the real objective is, for, let's, let's imagine a situation with uh, animals or humans where the real objective is really survive and reproduce. Um, there are sub-objectives to that, uh, which are, uh, you know, some, some, some are hardwired, like, you know, uh, feeding. 
uh, but some are not necessarily hardwired. Like, you know, for humans, uh, it's, it's nowhere hardwired that we should, you know, go to school or make money or things like this. But a lot of people kind of build this as a substitute objective function. Um, we again have examples, uh, you know, maximizing money um, um, uh, in the political world today. But, um, you know, they have kind of substitute objective functions that they seem to, to want to, uh, to optimize uh, as a way to optimize the ultimate one. So those are kind of... Um, things that are developed on the way to uh, uh, learning or, or producing uh, optimal behaviors. Um, so without being too technical, there, there, there would be uh, internal to the, the system, uh, again, the, the world simulator running uh, a simulation of the world, the actor producing a, a proposed sequence of action, and then the critic kind of figuring out, is that going to be good for me? Uh, and the better our world simulator is the, the, the more accurate the prediction of actions we can, uh, we can do. So one of the big questions that we don't know how to solve uh, with AI system is how do we build predictive models of the world? The rest we pretty much have a good handle on. We know how to build actors. The critic, maybe there is some difficulty, but, um, but we don't know how to build a world simulator. And the reason we don't know how to build it, um, let me skip ahead actually, is because uh, the world has the bad idea of being not entirely predictable. Um, so, so here is a, a very simple example. Let's say that we want to teach a machine to predict uh, uh, the state of the world in, in a half a second, and we're training it on very simple videos where we show it a few frames of a video, and then we stop the video and we ask it, uh, what is the world gonna look like half a second from now? A uh, fraction of a second from now. So here are two little videos where I put a, a pen on a, on a table and I let it go, and it falls. And machine maybe has been trained on, on thousands of, of, of those small videos and happens to predict the, the, the video at the bottom left where the pen falls to the left and the back. So this is the prediction of a generator, essentially a model of the world, that from the past predicts the, the future and perhaps some, for some you know, source of random uh, variable as well. But let's say in this particular video, the world actually disagrees and produces the, the one on the right where the pen falls to the back and to the right. And so it's the, 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 the prediction of the model was uh, quantitatively wrong. It's, it's, the result is different, but qualitatively right in the sense that it predicted the, the pen was gonna fall and you know, maybe not in the right direction because that was essentially unpredictable given the limits of the perception uh, of the system here. And so how do we train the machine to, in situations like this, and this is something that humans and animals deal with every day, where the prediction is fuzzy, is uncertain, and we want to train the machine the, the, to, to, we want to tell the machine, okay, you know, you got it wrong, but really you got it right qualitatively. Um, so essentially the, the possible futures are represented by this sort of ribbon here, um, this surface of, of possible futures. And the real future is one point that's on that ribbon, and the prediction of the system is another point on that ribbon, and we'd like to tell the machine, if you're on that ribbon, you're right. It doesn't matter that you are actually technically wrong, you're sort of right. And so that's kind of a, a you know, non-formal explanation of, of the, the problem of learning under, predicting under a certainty, really, which is what the, the sort of mathematical, practical, and algorithmic problem we have to solve to, to be able to do unsupervised learning. So if you asked me the question two years ago, how are we gonna solve this problem, or three years ago, I would have said, yeah, you know, I mean, there is tons of ideas, but none of them work. A lot of people have been working on this for a long, a long time, Jeffrey Hinton and uh, myself, Yosha Benjo, a bunch of other people on unsupervised running, but uh, none of them really worked that well, uh, at least not to the extent that, uh, to the same extent as animals and humans can learn um, forward models. But there's an idea that came up two years ago by a gentleman called Ian Goodfellow, who actually was a PhD student with Yosha Bengio uh, at the time, called adversarial training. I'm not gonna go into the details of how, how this works, but basically it involves training two different learning machines, two different neural nets against each other. So one is a predictor, and another one is an assessor, or called sometimes a discriminator, which uh, basically tries to figure out if the, the prediction it's observing comes from the real world, real data, or comes from the generator. And the generator, tries, the generator tries to fool it. It tries to generate points that look as much as possible as the real world so that the discriminator can tell the difference. And so it's this kind of adversarial training. And it's a very, very cute idea. A lot of people are experimenting with this these days for things like video prediction. 
Um, again, I can't explain exactly how it works, but um, people have trained those things not to do video prediction, but to do just image generation, so that the input to the system is a bunch of random vectors, and you run them through what amounts to a, a convolutional net backwards, which I'm not gonna explain how it works, but it basically produces images. And if you train this on bedrooms, and then you run a random vector in the system and have it generate an image, it will generate the image of a bedroom. And those are non-existing bedrooms generated by the system. And they have what it takes, you know, they have a bed, they have windows, they have dressers, they have, you know, lighting of various kinds. Um, you can have them generating manga characters and interpolate between them. Um, and you can even do arithmetics. So um, on the left, you see an image of a man with glasses. And what you can do is compute the input to the, the generator that will produce this image, okay, which is a vector. Um, you can also compute the vector that will generate a man with, without glasses and the vector that will generate a woman without glasses. And if you take the first vector, subtract the second vector, add the third vector, and then generate an image, you get a woman with glasses. How amazing is that? So that means in this kind of abstract space of vectors from which you can generate images, you can do kind of relatively simple uh, arithmetics that basically embed uh, relationships. You know, the man with glasses is to the man without glasses as the woman with glasses is to the woman without glasses. Essentially, that's what it means. Uh, various versions of this. Uh, so if you are in the back and you look at those images, you might think of those images are as pictures, you know, nice pictures from you know, various sources. If you're on the front and you look at those, um, you can tell that those are actually not objects. So those are images generated by one of those geometry models. And they capture the kind of statistics of images without actually capturing the notion of real objects. So those things don't, so this thing has been, has been trained on thousands of, almost millions of images actually to, uh, uh, from various categories, about a thousand different categories. And when you run a random vector through the, the system to generate an image, uh, it generates images that look like objects but are not objects. It's sort of abstract painting, but it looks like real, real thing. If you train it on dogs, <laughs> you know, it generates like Salvador Dali kind of dogs, like soft dogs, you know? <laughs> so it, it, you know, it's got the details right, but not kind of the big picture, and so that, you know, it's because the abstraction level at which those things are generated is a little too low. It, it hasn't really abstracted the notion of dog, really. It has abstracted kind of the statistics of dogs, if you want. Um, so it works also for video prediction. Uh, these are a few snippets of, of videos where the first four frames are observed, and then the last two frames, which are so-called in, in red, uh, are predicted by a video prediction system. And if you're not careful, if you train with sort of a classical algorithm that doesn't use this adversarial training, you get this very blurry prediction at the top here. So the system can do nothing but predict an average of all the possible futures, and that ends up being a blurry image that's kind of the average of all the possible things that can happen. Uh, but with this adversarial training, you get fairly sharp predictions, which may be wrong, but they look plausible. So other examples where here, uh, it's funny because we, 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 we take a, a photo that we, uh, we take a camera that we turn around and, uh, and the system has to predict, has to basically invent what this apartment is gonna look like that it's never seen before. And so, you know, it sort of continues the bouquets and um, the shape of the couch and all that stuff. Yeah. So what will uh, future AI systems be like? Okay, so this, um, it's difficult for us humans to imagine an intelligent entity that doesn't have the drives of and the failings of, of human nature. Uh, so as, as humans, uh, you know, we have uh, self-preservation instinct, we have the desire of access to resources, we don't starve. Uh, you know, some of us, not necessarily the smartest, have desire of access to power to control other people. So um, that's not necessarily correlated with intelligence, by the way. Um, so we, we have this uh, um, instinct of associating all of those um, uh, traits to, to intelligence. But in fact, they are, as, as, as Nick said earlier, they are orthogonal. So the, the kind of drives you, 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 you can have uh, and the sort of moral fiber you can have is orthogonal to your level of intelligence. You can have intelligent machines that are not, that don't have all the uh, failings of, 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 of humans. Um, so one way to make sure that uh, AI systems will have uh, 
uh, sort of a moral fiber, if you want, or, or basic drives that are aligned with, uh, with uh, human, human uh, um, uh, morality, essentially, is to design this objective that I was talking about earlier to, be, uh, uh, to, do, to make, get the machine to do the right thing, but also to be immutable so that the machine cannot modify it. And that's basically the way we're built. Those basic drives, we can't really modify them. Um, we can build on top of them, but we can't really um, uh, modify them. So that would be one way of preventing sort of unsafe AI, have kind of good designs for the, those objectives and, and, and safeguards uh, built into those objectives. But what can possibly go wrong? Well, um, you know, we can wrongly design the objective. Uh, we can build incompetent agents. Uh, or we can make them live in a world that's trolling them and turning them into bad robots. Um, um, and that happens. In fact, that's probably something that has consequences in the short term. So there is, you know, the famous example of the, the Thai uh, uh, dialogue bot that Microsoft deployed recently that got trolled immediately and um, they had to shut down in 24 hours. Um, so then there is the question, okay, so if, if you know, what if someone designs uh, an AI system to be purposely uh, nefarious and, uh, and sort of releases it, releases it to the world? And then it becomes an AI cyber war. Uh, basically becomes you know, a question of, is my AI stronger than your AI? And here is an interesting thing. Um, I think defensive AI in AI war will win because if you have two AI systems with the same amount of resources, one is a general AI and therefore potentially dangerous, but one is a very, very narrow AI and its only purpose is to destroy the first one. The second one will win. Uh, the same way the, you know, maybe a bacteria or a virus can kill you. It doesn't have to be that smart, but it has to be specialized. And so there is protection against, against you know, rogue AI, basically. It's specialized uh, AI working for us. Um, you know, there's uh, questions about uh, the economic uh, uh, consequences of AI, which I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip. But um, so when th another thing I think that's important for, for pe people in, in society and, and perhaps in this room to, to realize is that uh, the emergence of human-level AI will not be an event. It, it'll be progressive over several decades. It will, it will take multiple decades. Uh, people disagree on how many it, it will take. It's, it's definitely not going to happen in the next 10 years. Um, 20 years, some people ask questions. A century, perhaps. The problem is, as always in AI, we see the obstacles. We see one obstacle uh, in front of us. In my opinion, uh, un unsupervised learning is one of them. We see, we see this big mountain we have to climb. We don't see all the mountains behind it. And so it makes us a little optimistic because we think that by the time we're past this first mountain, we'll have solved the problem. Uh, the history of AI has been a repetition of finding new mountains behind the one you just, you just uh, passed. Um, the other thing is that no entity in the world, no lab, no company is significantly ahead of any other. Um, you know, in certain areas, maybe one can produce something three months before another, but it's immediately reproduced. So it's not like there is some secret lab somewhere in Alaska or whatever place where some genius is building a human-destroying AI. That just can't possibly happen. Um, it can't even possibly happen in labs like, like uh, DeepMind, Google, Facebook, um, IBM, Microsoft, etc., because all the research is done in the open, mostly. If it's not done in the open, it becomes open really quickly because, you know, people change companies and, you know, things like that. Um, so it won't be kind of a secret conspiracy, if you want. Um, and the, the good ideas come from academia anyway, so, you know. Um, um, last question. This is my last slide. Um, will AI fear disconnection? So this is a theme in, 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 uh, uh, you know, that, that was pervasive in some of the questions we had here and also in science fiction. The, in 2001, Space Odyssey, where held 9,000 gets disconnected, is uh, very scared, it kind of blocks the astronaut from going back into the spaceship because it is, is afraid of getting disconnected. Um, so will, will AI system be, be afraid of being disconnected? And I don't think so, because it's not necessary that we'll have, they will have self-preservation instinct. Again, we have to build that into them for, for them to be worried about it. And so we can design those objective functions so that it's not a problem for them to be disconnected. The second one is, you know, will it be morally wrong to disconnect them if they are intelligent? Uh, the way it's, you know, morally wrong to disconnect a, a person. 
And the thing is, it may not be morally wrong because you know, we, can, we can save their, their memory on a hard drive and restore them whenever we want, first of all. So they're not a unique piece of thing that will disappear if we turn them off, like, like, like what happens with humans. And second, they may not care for the reason above. And so if they don't care, and if we can revive them, then it probably isn't morally wrong to turn them off if we want to. Thank you. Okay, time for a couple of questions for Jan. Ned? Here. Come in. Um, you, you started off uh, scoffing at traditional AI. You know, people don't understand logic. And, um, um, but then you, you mentioned that, um, uh, toward the beginning of your talk, that um, um, deep learning networks of the sort you, you, you work with don't actually do memory very well. And then you proposed a memory module doesn't that suggest that there might be a room for traditional AI somewhere in the middle between a deep learning network for perception and a deep learning network for action? So right. I just so, wonder if you could uh, speak to that. Right. So I, it was not my intention to scoff at uh, traditional AI because I think it, you know I think it has a, uh, an important I mean it plays an important role. Uh, I think what, what's, if there is something that's wrong with it is the, the fact that the form in which it's formulated in terms of uh, you know, logic and symbols makes it very difficult to uh, be compatible with, with learning, or at least the learning techniques that we understand today, which are based on gradients and numerical optimization and things like this, which are you know, very non-discrete. So logic is discrete, and what we know how to, the kind of machine we know how to train are kind of continuous, if you want. And so I think the, the, the ideal combination between the two, which is what those memory networks and differential computation systems are, is basically how can we implement the, op the type of operations that uh, classical AI systems with you know, uh, knowledge bases and, and, and rules can, can do, but make them differentiable so that they can be compatible with deep learning and we can train them to do uh, complex uh, operations. So you know, I'm agreeing to the implied uh, suggestion you were, you were making, I think. Um. Excellent talk. Uh, so part of intelligence is being able to describe things. And you know me, I come from machine learning. Prediction is our bread and butter, but part of intelligence is description, being able to describe or explain things. Where does that fit within your wor world view of AI? So I think that's part of uh, human intelligence. So you know, what's, uh, one essential characteristic of, of, of humans is, as social animals is, the, is language. But, a lot of animals are pretty smart and can't really describe things very well. Uh, at least we don't have the feeling that they can. Maybe they can. Um, right. So. Okay. So there are two. Th there are two things there, right? Uh, I mean, certainly some animals uh, are trained. Some, a lot of mammals in particular are, are you know, get a lot of input from their parents uh, to to learn, uh, learn to survive. Uh, some animals don't. So, uh, you know, octopus are pretty smart, and the, the, the mother dies when the babies are born. And so they, they, they never train. They're not social animals, and they're pretty smart. They can solve problems. They can open jars to get crabs out of them. And, you know, um, so there are different forms of intelligence, some, some that require interaction with, uh, uh, with peers, uh, some that may not, just interaction with the world. And the necessity for explanation or description is something that comes with language and social animals, but there is plenty of animals also who are very smart and not particularly social, like orangutans. So, so I, th I think, again, it's one of those examples where we think the, the human characteristics are necessary for intelligence, but really they aren't. They, they, you know, language is not necessary for intelligence, perhaps. I mean, that's a very controversial <laughs> statement in this room. Maybe I should, uh, I should have brought a... Um, <laughs> Okay, let's get one more from Stuart, and while that's going on, let's get Nick and Virginia up on stage. Uh, okay, so I actually have two questions. Uh, so one is, we're training all these recognition networks to recognize sheep, cars, you know, Bugattis. Uh, those are discrete things. If, if we're hoping that these deep learning networks will sort of grow into a whole agent, why, why and they can't handle discrete, you know, classical, logical, concepts and objects, then that, that just seems like a complete mismatch. 
uh, the second question is um, uh, on this issue of self-preservation. You see, we don't have to build self-preservation uh, into the robot. But the robot, if it's half halfway intelligent, knows that it can't, for example, fetch the coffee if it's dead. So we don't have to build self-preservation in. If it's going to fetch the coffee and there's a big hole in the floor, it will go around the hole so it doesn't fall into it. So it will, for all practical purposes, have a self-preservation instinct. If someone tries to switch it off and it has the goal of fetching the coffee, it will prevent the perf person from switching it off. Yeah, but what it won't have is a huge surge of adrenaline when it feels threatened. And it, it doesn't it, matter. It, it, violent, what it, what right? it doesn't matter, right? What matters is what does it do? Well, it doesn't, okay. I don't care whether it feels threatened or whether it worries about death. What I care about is does it prevent me from switching it off? Does it mow down pedestrians who get in the way of between it and the coffee? You know, so, those, are, those, those are things that matter. <laughs> so I guess, I mean, that's a very important question. And, it, and it's essentially uh, embedded in this, um, how, the question of how you design this objective, right? So in the objective, there are very kind of low-level primary objectives like, uh, you know, build paper clips or whatever. Uh, but, you know, we can have other terms in the objective function that says, you know, don't turn the whole universe into paperclips. Like, you know, limit the amount of resources you use. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, golden rule like, um, like, uh, like, like objectives in, the, in them. So sort of relatively simple things that can be uh, implemented that will kind of make them safe, safe. But it's all a question of how do we design this objective? I don't think they are, I don't think those are like fundamental questions of, oh my God, things will go bad if, uh, uh, you know, by default. I mean, it's hard enough to build a machine that does anything. So, uh, you know, like building a machine that is going to destroy humanity by accident. I, I find that as an engineer, I find that extremely unlikely. But, um, uh, but it, it all comes down to designing those objective functions. So the way you do this is, you know, you build a machine with the objective function, you test it thoroughly without actually giving it real power, right? And, uh, and you have all kinds of safeguards if you really scared about it. I mean, that's the way we build airplanes. That's the way we build just about anything that we use. Power stations. Occasionally. It's happened twice. OK, thank you very much. <laughs> OK, now we've just got time for a brief uh, panel discussion. Might first see if any of the uh, the speakers have questions for each other. On somewhere? It's on, I think. But it's on? Okay. It uh, sure. Uh, I like your idea of designing objectives to the representing the, the morals or the ethics of the 